Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about Newton's second law. For rotation. All right, so let me imagine right, that I have some object here, some mass m at some position, uh, let's say it's r away from some origin here, origin, okay, and it's going to rotate around this object, this point here, and let's apply a force to this object here, Okay, the force is in some direction like that. All right, uh, <clears throat> and now this thing is going to be, uh, let's say, for um, simplicity's sake, that I will um, try to keep this thing in tension. So this thing is R is going to be fixed. So this is going to be some tension to some string here. And it's going to basically hold this thing at some fixed distance r away from it, all right? Okay, so uh, let's adopt an axis around this object, okay? Let's adopt basically the uh, x-axis going this way. And for argument's sake, let's adopt the y-axis going this way. That's the y-axis there, all right? That's my x-axis, all right? And so I can write down this force this force of f of x will have some f of x this way and some f of y that way. Okay, so f of x in this case is equal to f, right, let's give an angle here. This angle here is, um, uh, no, 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 got the wrong angle here, sorry. This angle here is phi, say. So this can be f of cosine of phi. And f of y, just point it down that way, is going to be minus f sine of phi. Okay, so uh, this thing's a string, so there's going to be some tension t associated with this thing. And so if I sum up the forces, uh, and then so this object's moving with some velocity, say, for instance, um, sum of the forces in the x direction, this is f net of x. Well, that's just going to be, let's see, there's two pieces of forces. There's, there's a minus the tension, right? Tension pointing away in the minus x direction, plus the force in the x direction. That's going to be equal to minus mac, right? Where this is just going to be equal to the centripetal acceleration the mass times the velocity squared over r, all right? And so, recall, um, this is equal to minus m r omega squared, right? Where omega is the angular velocity. Okay. All right. So that's basically the first force here. So this just basically keeps it in a circle. This keeps it All right. But there's another force here as well. All right. The net force in the y direction. Well, that's the sum of the forces in the y direction. There's only one force. It's just this one. So it's just going to be equal to minus f um, sine of phi, right? And so this can be the mass times acceleration in the y direction, right? Which is the mass times acceleration in tangential direction. This is tangential acceleration. which basically implies that the tangential acceleration A of T is equal to, well, see, it's just going to be F minus F sine theta, sine phi, sorry, over the mass. Okay. 
So in this case, basically, this is the tangential acceleration. This is also the net tangential force as well. Right? So basically, this thing right here is F net of T tangential net force. Just by construction, basically, right? So this is Y is the tangent in this case. So that's going to have to be the tangential acceleration. And so this can be equal to um, uh, m r times alpha. So this is the angular acceleration. Right. And if I multiply this by r on both sides again, okay, then what I'm going to get is I'm going to get this is m r squared. That's just I times alpha, right? This is mr squared. This is mr squared, right? Because it's just a mass attached to a string. So the moment of inertia for that is just simply mr squared. Okay. So what I have is that this is R times F net tangent is equal to I times alpha. So we can define tau, I'll call it net, is equal to R F net tangent, right? Is the net torque. All right, so this is the torque, okay? So general, in general, the net torque for some force, torque is going to be equal to basically L times F tangent. So this is the tangential force. And this is the distance to rotation axis. Right? Okay. Now, um, in this particular case, all right, so in the case above, let's just keep going. Tau, right, there's only one torque, so that's why the net torque is just equal to the regular torque. This is just basically L times FT. In this case, it was, it was um, uh, let's get it right, R times F sine phi, okay? So you read this one as the tangential force, and this is distance to the origin, right? But you can also regroup this thing to be F times R sine phi, right? Just basically it's multiplication, so you just group it as well as you want. So let's look at the differences between these two things here, all right? Okay. Um, so we draw a picture of what we had earlier. So let's imagine this is the force. I have a force which is going along this way, say, all right? Um, and let's see, so this is by here, right? Okay, so there's two ways of thinking about this. The first way to think about it is that I can write down the tangent force, Ft is just equal to F times sine of phi, right? Or I can, and this is basically this distance here is R, or I can trace it back. To the point where this is the right triangle here. And in this case, this is because of the parallel, because these things crossing, this thing's also phi as well, right? So r times um, sine of phi is this length right here, r sine of phi, okay? 
So that we can also define as L, right? So it's equal to um, F times L, where L is the moment arm. Okay? So the same is basically you draw the force, it's the same as the force at a particular R, it's the same as this if you drew the force back, you operate on a different R, okay? So you have either a component of the transdential force or you have a component of the slow force, basically where it meets a right angle with it, okay? So those are two ways of interpreting uh, this particular construction here, okay? Okay, so uh, as an example of this, Let's consider the torque due to gravity. Okay, so let's draw something here. So let's imagine that I have uh, some blob of a mass and this is the center of mass. Center of mass. And suppose I basically pin it down, so this is the rotation axis. And so if the rotation axis is not center, what's going to happen is this is going to feel a force due to gravity, essentially pulling it down, so basically m times g. Right? Okay. So, What's going to happen is that this will basically feel a force here, right? And you can basically uh, compute what that force is. You basically can write this thing up. So this distance here is x center mass. So the tau due to gravity is just going to be x center mass, right? This thing is better form of some right triangle times m times g. Okay. So what happens is that as this thing swings downward, it swings downward a little bit later. That this the center mat the XCM, which is the moment arm, is smaller. Okay, All right. And so if it basically swings perfectly, perfectly vertically, then there's no torque in this object. And this is something you know. Basically, if you have an object that's hanging straight down, it's just not going to swing anymore. It's not going to try to rotate. Okay. All right, so let's try um, another example here, right? Let's try a more solid example here that's uh, much more of a, uh, uh, a, a example. So let's imagine I have a, a disc, okay? And I'm going to give this disc uh, some mass here. Let me just try to figure out how I want to do this right. Um, Right, so this mat, this disc, has a mass, basically, let's say, give it 10 kilograms, say, all right? Uh, and has radius r. Capital R, that is, all right? And I'm going to make a smaller wheel in here, okay? And this r is significantly smaller. This is, uh, say, um, r over 4, say, all right? And I'm going to attach a string to this object, this. Where I'm going to apply a force is equal to 10 newtons, right? Okay? Um, let's write the angle clearer. Now, the question I want to ask is basically, uh, what's the torque in this case, all right? So what is tau and what is the angle acceleration of alpha? All right, so let's go ahead and do that. So tau is equal to, well, it's the moment arm times F, right? So let's figure out the moment arm. It's going to be this distance right here. In this case, it's R over 4. So it's going to be R over 4 times F, which is 10 um, newtons, all right? And uh, let me just make sure it's going to be okay. Well, let's give this thing an, an R equal to 1 meter, say, okay? Right, so we can actually solve for this thing in a second. 
exactly. All right, so then we have that, right? And so that's the net torque because that's the only torque in the problem, right? And so this is going to be equal to I times alpha. All right, so what is I times alpha? Well, I is equal to, for a disk, is one half mR squared, okay? And so we have basically R over four times F is equal to one half mR squared, that's I times alpha, which is what, basically what I need. So this is basically tau, got that first, now I'm going to have to solve for this one. Let's kill this off, that's a one there. Let's uh, kill this off, that becomes a two there, all right? Okay, and so let's plug in the numbers now. So this is basically one half times 10 is equal to, the mass is one, the radius, well, sorry, 10, the radius was one, and whatever alpha is, alpha is basically what we're trying to find. So then what we have is that alpha is equal to one half, let's get the units right, radians per second squared. Okay? And so basically that's one, one example here. Okay, let's try um, another example here, okay? Another example is suppose basically we're doing something similar. Uh, we're gonna take a um, this disc here, same disc, and we're gonna basically offset it, right? So this is disc is have some R, has the disc mass. I say this is 10 kilograms again. R again is equal to one meter, and suppose this distance here is two R. All right, okay. And I'm going to attach it here to be smooth out. So you can think of this as like a really short um, uh, pendulum, right? Okay, so let's compute tau again. Tau is equal to L times F, all right? Uh, fortunately, I picked everything well, so everything is at right angles here. So this field of force here is the M times G. So let's compute that thing out. So uh, L is this distance here, so that's basically two R. The force is M times G, right? And this is gonna be equal to I times alpha, all right? Because this is a net torque, this object. Okay, so um, that's two R, make this capital M, capital M times G is equal to I times alpha. Now we gotta be careful here, this I if it was rotating through center, it would be one half um, mR squared, but it's not, okay? It's off center, so we gotta be careful about that. So I is equal to I H squared plus I center of the mass, sorry, 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 mR squared times I center of mass, right? So the parallel axis theorem. So it's going to be equal to, let's see, so it's M, H is the twice the distance, so it's 2R squared plus 1 half MR squared, okay? So it's basically going to be M, uh, 4R squared plus 1 half MR squared. So that's going to be, what, uh, 9 halves, right? Yeah. 9 sorry, half m r squared. All right, so that's i. So that's the i we have to use, right, because it's off center. So let's plug that in. So this is the two r m g is equal to nine half m r squared times alpha. So lo and behold, m's kill each other, which is very nice, actually. And so we have 2g is equal to 9 halves r times alpha, which implies that alpha is equal to, see it's 4 ninths g over r. Okay, so we plugged everything in, that's 4 ninths, and then g is 10, r was 1, and so this is what, uh, 
for you or not. Okay, uh, radian per second squared. Okay, so that's kind of nice. Okay, so this was basically uh, horizontal with the with the with the ground. Now let's basically move it at not so horizontal distance. Same situation as before. Okay. This is R. That's 2R. This is M. And now we're going to basically put an angle theta. Theta equals 30 degrees. Right? Now let's compute everything out again. So tau is equal to L times F. Okay. Now in this case, I need to get, get the moment arm. That's the moment arm right there, right? So it's going to be 2R times the sine of theta, that's the moment arm, so this is L, times the force, which is M times G. Okay, so it's going to be equal to I times alpha. So from before, we know what i is. i was basically uh, 9 halves mr squared times alpha. And so the only change is the fact that we have a sine theta there. Right? So let's put that all that stuff in. 2r sine theta m times g is equal to 9 halves mr squared times alpha. 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, and so the only difference here, you solve it, alpha is equal to 4 ninth g over r times sine of theta, right? So if you work this out, this again is going to be 40 over 9 times sine of 30 degrees. Sine of 30 degrees is a half, so it's 20 over 9. Radian per second squared. Okay, so that's very nice. All right, so um, there's one more thing I have to show you about all this stuff, and that is that um, a lot of times we deal with um, uh, rolling, okay, or, or pulling, okay, and so the one thing I need to introduce you is going to call it the no slip condition. And roll it. Okay. Now, um, now in order to do that, um, we sort of have to introduce some uh, key ideas, right? So what no slip basically means is that uh, if you have a situation we have the following. So for instance, you have basically something that's uh, pulling some direction here. Okay. This is some R say. Okay. And it's rotating with some omega and it rotates and makes room with some V. Okay. That the tangential velocity is going to be equal to R times omega. Now in reality it's plus or minus R times omega. Now I'll discuss the R plus R plus or minus in just a second, right? But these are related to each other through this through this thing. So that the tangential velocity is what's happening at the, at the at the edge is essentially equal to basically the rotation rate times r, right? This is just the no slip condition. Right? Likewise, if you take a derivative of this, okay, so d by dt on both sides, then then what you have is the tangential acceleration is equal to plus or minus r times alpha, assuming r does not change, right? which usually it does not. Okay? So the two no slip conditions is basically this one and dt equals plus or minus r times omega. Right? So now the important thing is like what determines the plus or minus? So um, when we choose basically what a, a and b are, the signs of a and b, 
uh, at least in one dimension, we have to basically pick what the direction of x is, right? So we pick, we pick a direction for positive x, okay? Uh, there's also a coordinate basically related to um, rotation. So, okay, so we need to pick a direction for rotation, okay? And generally, what happens is that what you want to do when you have something rotating is that you want to pick positive theta or positive phi in the counterclockwise direction. So usually pick plus theta in counterclockwise direction. Okay, for all things that you draw down based on a piece of paper. Right? And so you have to based on this, you have to pick basically which direction it is which, right? So for instance, in this case, x is going positive that way. If I pick omega in this direction, what, ha what I have to choose is that if this thing is rotating in the positive direction, then b has to be in the negative direction. In this case, this is vt is equal to minus r omega. If I basically place it on the bottom, okay, if I was pulling a string on the bottom, then moving in the positive theta direction causes the string to move in the positive v direction. In that case, basically, vt is equal to plus r omega, right? So that's a key thing that we all have to basically keep in mind. All right, so with this in mind now, uh, we can go ahead and try to do a particular example of using the snow slip condition uh, in the actual problem. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's consider the following example. All right. Let me imagine I have um, a disc. All right. It's fixed at the center. All right. It has a mass. I'll call this mass uh, this this M1. It has a mass 10 kilograms. It has some R. Again. R. I'll choose it to be one meter. At the end of that, we'll put a string. I'll attach a second mass. M2, which is one kilogram, and this is going to feel some force basically due to gravity. M2g. Okay. Now this is a string, so there's going to be exert some tension force associated with this thing, right? And all this stuff is basically going to act upon each other. All right. So the first thing I'm going to try to do is I'm going to look at what the what the how this mass is. So you know what's going to happen, right? If this is a string. This thing will start to unwind, this thing will start to spin out, and this thing will start to fall. So what happens is that the net force on two, right, in the y direction, say, is going to be equal to, let's choose y to be this way, right? And it's going to be minus m2g plus the tension, tension is positive, is equal to m2 times a, right? I'll figure what that is going to be. Right. Now, on this disc, it's going to feel a tension force. So, F, um, I'll write tau net on 1. That's going to feel a tension force. So, it's going to feel a tension force, um, a tension force times some distance. Uh, the moment arm in this case is simple, it's just times r. Now, the only thing is I got to figure out basically which direction it's going to rotate it. So, this thing wants to, the tension force is um, uh, in the, uh, it's going to cause it to try to rotate in the clockwise direction, right? But I usually want to choose theta plus in the counterclockwise direction. So in this case, this tension force is actually negative, all right? Because it's going to try to rotate in the clockwise direction. And it's going to be equal to I times alpha, all right? Now, I need my no slip condition to basically link up alpha and a. So, uh, no slip to link up alpha and a. And let's be very careful. So I chose y. If a is positive, that means basically this thing is selling outward. That means it's going 
in this direction. That causes it to rotate in the counterclockwise direction, which is exactly what I need. So in this case, basically, the nose condition will be um, A is equal to R times alpha with a positive sign here, right? Because basically, these are in line with each other. Okay, so if I set this up correctly, everything should just work out. So let's go ahead and do it now, right? So what I have is that I have minus M2G plus the tension is equal to M2 times A. I also have that um, uh, minus T times R is equal to I. Now I is going to be 1 half M1 R squared times alpha. Uh, that's alpha, right? And so if I do this, I'll kill this thing off. There we go. That's minus T is equal to 1 half M1 R times alpha. Guess what? This can be plugged into there. All right? So it's equal to 1 half M1 A is minus T. I'm going to take this thing here, that solves for t, so it implies that t is equal to minus 1 half m1a. So I'll take this and plug it into that one, right? So it's minus m2g uh, minus 1 half m1a is equal to m2a. So combine all the terms together, that means minus m2. Oops minus m2g is equal to m2 plus 1 half m1 times a, okay? And so we have our answer a is equal to minus m2g divided by m2 plus 1 half m1, all right? So let's go ahead and check everything first. First of all, m2 is m1, so positive, so this is positive here. Uh, that's positive. G is basically uh, 10 uh, meters per second squared. Um, so this is a positive value. So this overall is negative. Does that make sense? This thing's solving downward. So yes, it's negative, right? That makes sense. And so because it's related via the no-slip condition, that means that uh, if A is negative, R is positive, that means alpha is negative too. Does that make sense? Yes. It's alpha is negative because it's rotating in the clockwise direction. So all that checks out. So now we can just go ahead and plug in our numbers now. M2 was 1, so it's minus. G is 10, divided by 1 plus M2 is 1 half times 10, right? So it's basically um, a minus 10 over 6, which is minus 5 thirds um, uh, meters per second squared, all right? So it accelerates downward at this particular rate. Okay, now uh, let's consider another one, say. Right, okay. Um, let's consider the following. Now let's imagine I have some um, ball here and it's going to roll down some inclined plane right? such that eventually it reaches some bottom. So, okay. so the difference in height, okay, now be sure to draw the center of mass here. This is H here. Okay. All right, and let's say H, let's say, let's give this thing some mass. This is a 10 kilogram mass, all right, uh, R here is equal to 0 0.1 meters, okay? And this thing's gonna roll down this thing a height of about uh, one meter, all right? Okay, and the question is, what is V at the end, all right? Okay, so this is a simple conservation energy problem. So basically E 
is equal to, well, there's two forms of energy. It's basically kinetic energy plus the potential energy, right? And the kinetic energy comes in two forms, right? There's the rotational energy, so one half I omega squared plus the kinetic energy, one half mv squared uh, plus potential energy, which is mg times y, all right? So let's choose y. V zero here. That means y equals one meter there. In that case, okay. And um, the way we're gonna get do this basically is that it starts from rest at the top. Okay. So let's just write down the initial condition. So E mechanical initial is equal to uh, one half i omega i squared plus uh, one half uh, m v i squared plus now m g y. Okay, so this was initially zero. This was initially zero because omega is zero, v i the I is zero. Plus now this one I chose it to be one meter, so it's going to basically be the mass of this thing. It's ten, g is ten, and y is one. Okay, pretty simple. Okay, so this is a hundred. Or whatever heck that is, right? So this is the final state. The mechanical energy as final state is one half i omega f squared plus one half mv f squared plus mg. I'll call it yf, right? This is my i say. Okay, so in this case, I have one half i omega f squared plus one half m vf squared, right? Plus now this one I know exactly because it ends up at y equals zero. So that's just basically zero. Right? So now the only thing I have to basically is figure out what this thing has to be. Now in order to do that, I have to use a no-slip condition. And just look at it carefully. Right? So I'm going to choose that this thing is a positive in this direction, positive um, theta, okay? And when it rotates this way, it's basically moving in the that's in positive x direction, right? So if this thing is moving in this direction, that causes this thing to rotate clockwise. And so basically this axis and this axis are contrary to each other. So in this case what I have is the omega, oh, sorry, V is equal to R times omega with a minus sign there. It doesn't matter for this problem because it all squares it out. But if there are some problems where it will matter. Okay, so let's basically put this together. This is one half i times um, omega f squared um, plus one half m v f squared. Okay, that's plus zero. So this, let's see, this is omega is equal to um, v over r with minus sign. So it's one half. Okay, so let's see. I think this is a disk, so it's gonna be one half m r squared times basically minus v over r squared plus one half v final here. One half m v final squared is equal to that. Okay, uh, e mechanical. And so let's continue working this out. So these squares will kill each other. So it's basically one quarter m v f squared plus one half m v f squared is three quarters m v f squared is equal to e mechanical initial, right? Because conservation of energy, which is like 100. All right, so let's plug everything out. Three quarters times mechanical is 10. Vf squared is equal to 100. So this basically is going to equal to um, 40 over 3. Okay, and we need to just go ahead and solve that thing right now. Uh, let's get my calculator. I don't have a good calculator. Never have a good calculator here. Uh, there we go. I use my stupid phone sucks. Okay, well anyway, so um, let's see, it's 40 divided by 3, okay, 13 point something, square root, oh shoot, 
Okay, so let's do the square root of 13.3, that's 3.64. So that implies that VF is equal to the square root of 40 over 3, which is uh, 3.6 meters per second. All right, and that's it for this one. Wait, so that was that one. Right, and then, okay, so, yep, perfect, okay. So, uh, last but not least, all right, uh, let's do the following problem. I'll start a new page for this one, actually. Um, let's look for the, uh, another example, is the acceleration of a ball. So rather than looking at this, we look at a ball now. So this is some ball here. Let's give this some uh, R here, some mass, it's a ball. It's going down an inclined plane, say, for instance. The inclined plane has an angle of theta here, okay? So I'm gonna compute A of the ball, okay? All right, so let's draw a free body diagram of this thing. So this thing has a force mg, okay, um, because it's going to start rot spinning, it's going to have some force of friction, which is going to be pulling in this direction, that's the force of friction, okay, I'm drawing, rather than drawing from the center, I draw from the edge of this thing, because that's where the force of friction is acting, but I also need to do that in order to basically generate some torque around this object, right, and this thing has some basically fg of x in this direction, and of course there's some normal force here, and then there's some uh, fg of y there as well. All right. Now, this is static friction. And so this static friction will do what it takes in order to basically make sure that everything is in balance. Right. So let's compute net torque first. This is going to be equal to, there's only one torque on this thing. If you try to compute this thing, this acts in the center. So it's at the rotation axis. So it won't do anything. So you just have basically this part right here, which is going to be r. So it would be R times the force of friction. Let's see what direction this rotates. So this force of friction, um, let me just make sure I want to get this thing right. So the force of friction points this way, so it will cause a spin in the uh, uh, clockwise direction. So let's, get, let's make sure this thing is the negative sign here. So it will be minus R times F, F is equal to I times alpha. All right? Do not make the mistake of setting this equal to the force kinetic, which is mu k, uh, mu sub k times f of n. Do not make that mistake. This force of friction will do what it takes to get this thing to spin up. All right. Now let's look at the net force. All right. So this is going to be equal to. Let's pick the uh, x direction, this direction now. Okay. Um, this is going to be equal to f of x, g of x minus force of friction is equal to this is mass times a sub x all right okay so this can be equal to mg sine theta minus f of f is equal to m a sub x all right so now we need the no slip condition all right so the no slip condition Let's see, so if this thing is accelerating in the positive x direction, that means this thing will want to rotate clockwise, which is negative. So I want basically theta to be in that direction. And so what I have is that r times alpha is equal to minus a sub x. All right, so that's my no slip condition. And now let's plug this thing in. So I have this, I'll plug it in here. So it's going to be equal to minus r times f of f is equal to, now this is this uh, ball, so it's 2 fifths m r squared times alpha um, a sub, sorry, alpha is equal to minus a sub x over r. So that's minus a sub x over r. Okay, let's kill this one, that kills that one, that kills that one, that kills that one again. 
minus f of f is equal to minus 2 fifths m a sub x. Okay? So that means that turn that positive and I'll plug it into there. Okay? So I do that. So it's basically mg sine of theta minus 2 fifths m a sub x is equal to m a sub x. Right? So I'll bring this aside. mg sine theta is equal to 7 fifths m a sub x. Look at that. m's will kill each other now. And now we're done. a sub x is equal to 5 7 g sine theta. Alright? Okay. Now, if this thing was just a simple mass that was just uh, rolling down, okay, the difference is that, okay, if this is a simple mass, if it was not rotating, a sub x would be equal to g sine of theta, right? So this thing, the 7 fifths, basically just implies that it's less, it doesn't accelerate as rapidly because in addition to basically get speeding up the object, you're also starting to spin up the object as well, okay? So that's the difference, right? So it makes sense if the acceleration is less than what you would have otherwise presumed. Okay, so that's basically it for um, this lecture.